And so, Ambassador Dermer, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it's good that I spent a lot of my time thinking because uh, somebody told me once that the worst way to think uh, or the least productive way to think is to actually think. A better way is to have a discussion. And the best way to think is actually to write because then you're in a dialogue with yourself. Uh, so maybe we can open up a bit of a discussion. But let me start by uh, giving you two disclaimers uh, so you know what my views are. First of all, Netanyahu is to the left of me economically. I should say, to the left of me economically. Um, I came in as a capitalist, unabashed, uh, to the Wharton School of Business. I left there as a more unabashed capitalist. Uh, I'm unabashed in not only that I believe um, that free market uh, capitalism is better for growth, which is important because we can have a lot of income redistribution discussions and we'll spend all our time talking about cutting up the cake rather than figuring out how to grow it. I think any serious analysis of economic numbers over time shows that capitalism uh, is a great force for growth. But I actually believe in capitalism on a moral basis, on a moral basis. And I think this is where a lot of the defenders of capitalism make a mistake. They cede the moral ground to their opponents. And the opponents say, well, that's true, but what about justice? And I completely disagree. When you have a situation in the world today that you got about two billion people who were lifted up out of poverty in Asia because of free markets and they were not there before, that's just about the most just thing that you have. And Adam Smith remarked 200 years ago that, uh, how did he put it, the, the um, worker, the average worker in England lives better um, than some of the princes of Africa. I think that was the exact quote that he, uh, that he had uh, said. So people should never forget that. Um, so for me, from my point of view, uh, capitalism is not just um, a smarter and more efficient system, um, it's also a far more just system. And I'll say that with one caveat. I mean, was a big fan of, uh, of Hayek, if any of you have read him. When the Prime Minister became the Finance Minister, um, I gave him Hayek's book, The Road to Freedom, um, which he had not read at the time, surprisingly. I wrote to serfdom, yeah, thank you. The Road to Serfdom. Your book was the Case for Freedom. The Case for Freedom. I'm getting confused. <laughs> No, actually, my book was supposed to be called The Case for Freedom, and unfortunately, I listened to the publisher, and he said that freedom was too politicized. Let's call it The Case for Democracy, which is a big problem because democracy for most people means elections, and that's not what we talk about. You don't just run to a society that's not free, have an election, and call it a democracy. But in any case, it's, uh, it's a long story. Uh, I gave the prime minister the book, The Road to Serfdom. He had not, um, he had not read it. Um, but the most important thing to understand, at least in terms of my view about capitalism, is when you read uh, Hayek or you read especially Milton Friedman, um, every time you see the word capitalism, it comes with a word before it, competitive capitalism. The overriding principle of capitalism must be competition. And a lot of times the public discourse around the economic debate is about whether the government should intervene or not, more government, less government. Uh, business versus uh, labor. I don't believe that that is the debate. There should only be one goal, and that's to promote maximum competition. And that sometimes means that you need a strong government. Sometimes it means that you need a weaker government. Sometimes it means that the government has to pull back. Sometimes it means that the government has to go in. Nine out of ten times, it means less government and less intervention. But there is times that you have to break up monopolies and you have to break up trust because you're promoting competition. The driving principle um, that achieves uh, both a more efficient system and also a more just system is competition because competition will certainly breed excellence. It will create much more economic growth. It will create much better products and much lower prices. And there is nothing better for justice than to have uh, goods that are cheaper that a lot more people can enjoy. So, for instance, I'll just give you a small example. I remember in 1990. Seven, um, there are many Israelis here today, and, and some of them may be my age as well, but you may remember, at least in 96, it cost a dollar a minute to call the United States on a phone. When I first moved to Israel, it cost me a dollar a minute to call my mother, which made for a great excuse why I wouldn't call her, I have to say. Um, and there was a big debate in Israel in 96 uh, and 97 about adding some competition into this phone monopoly, the Bezik phone monopoly. And a lot of people were against it. And they said, well, it's going to ruin Bezik. Uh, 
and the, um, the quality is going to go way down. And there was a big push, and Prime Minister, and I think uh, Limor Livnat, I think, was the communication minister at the time. And they pushed and they added two different phone companies in Israel. And within six months, or even less, the price of a phone call went down from a dollar to 18 cents. And then it went down to about nine cents or eight cents. And then it gained, got to the point where it actually was more expensive to call Jerusalem to Tel Aviv than it was to call the United States. Why do I say that? Because that to me is all economics in a nutshell. You had a monopoly that raised prices. You had the entrance of new people into that market. You had more competition in the market. Don't understand that just because you privatize something doesn't mean that you've added more competition. Generally speaking, pri I, a company in private hands is better than being in government hands because a company in private hands can go bankrupt. And anytime you have the risk of bankruptcy, it has some check. Whereas government companies never go bankrupt because it's the taxpayers who are paying for it and, and no one ever sees it. But there's all sorts of issues that we can discuss about privatization. But as a general, understand that model. 96, one, one uh, uh, phone company, a dollar a minute to call the United States. So fortunately, I was well off enough to be able to call my mother, but there are a lot of people who live in Sterot, or who lived in uh, Haifa, or in the Galil, or in other parts of the country, who could not make that phone call. Or to call their relative, it's like they could do that maybe once or twice a year. And all of a sudden, overnight, all of those people can. That's social justice to me. Competition is the thing that drives social justice, and it also drives economic growth. That's the first cat. The second is I have a deep bias towards the prime minister, a deep bias, and I'll explain why. I went with the prime minister 10 years ago when he became finance minister. His first trip abroad was to, um, was to England, and he was asked a question. I don't even know if he had come out with his economic plan yet. It may have been even in the first month while before he was formulating it, and he was asked a question. Who was more impressive, Thatcher or Reagan? And what do you think he said? Anyone want to guess? Thatcher. Why? Why? No. No. He said because America was built right to begin with. And America was basically a freer society with a freer economy, and Thatcher had to come into England and give it a huge kick to take a quasi-feudal, quasi-socialist, a, uh, an over-regulated, over-taxed economy uh, and to free it up. Reagan had his challenges, but the country itself and the mindset of the country was different than it was uh, in Britain. So for me, by that standard, Netanyahu was actually much more impressive than even Thatcher. Because Netanyahu has taken a socialist country and tried to turn it into a free market country. And he did it without the tools that Thatcher has. Just to understand the mindset in Israel. Now, you'll, how many Israelis are here? It's just a show of hands. Okay. I was shocked to find out when I moved to Israel that you can politically attack your opponent in Israel by calling him a capitalist. I am not making this up. You call somebody a capitalist, that is an attack. In this country, you call somebody a socialist, that's an attack. And even in some quarters, you can call them a liberal and that would be attacked. In Israel, I'm shocked to understand, I saw one politician, I remember the first time I saw it, he's a capitalist. Yeah, and that's an attack. So this is the mindset of the country. And more than that, Israel is a country that politically, for a leader, for an Israeli prime minister, much fewer tools or much less political power in order to actually advance his agenda than an American president who has the presidency in an office and he has to show up to the polls once every four years or even to a British Prime Minister. And British Prime Minister essentially controls the party and can get almost anything uh, through. British Prime Minister in their system has actually more power than an American president. It just happens that England is not as powerful a country as the United States is. But an Israeli Prime Minister has these coalitions with all these trade-offs. He doesn't have that uh, kind of power. And Israel does not really have capitalist parties. The Likud has not traditionally been a capitalist party at all. It has it had small faction in it that's been a free market uh, party, but essentially Likud has been a populist party and Labor has been a socialist party. Netanyahu is kind of unique in being the first unabashed capitalist prime minister of the country. So we've had now, I don't know, 13, 12, 13 prime ministers. Only one has really been a capitalist. They've either been socialists or statists or corporatists or something, but only one has been a capitalist. And I think that makes um, 
what he has done, um, truly remarkable, because it's not just about the policy, and we can have a discussion about this or that policy. It's about changing the mindset of Israel, changing the mindset of a country where capitalism is a bad word to be able to make people understand um, uh, that capitalism is both the right system and also the morally just system. And all everyone here knows that in the last two years, you could say you took a big step back because the whole political discourse in Israel was much more moving towards populism and towards the past rather than anchoring these ideas for more competition, more freedom, um, uh, and, any, and everything else. So that's my two disclaimers. Now, the way that I see Israel and why I'm extremely bullish about Israel's future is precisely because I think Israel, Israel's economy was so screwed up to begin with. Um, when you see something that is so screwed up, you fix it, you get a lot of growth. Now, if we were a very open um, economy with a lot of competition in all the sectors, with no monopolies and no control, I'd say it would really be hard to squeeze uh, growth out of Israel. Uh, but we're not. We've got a lot of problems. Uh, and to me, that's an enormous opportunity. Now, if you look at, if I look at Israel's past, what I see is basically the first four decades a socialist period of growth. And I'm not going to get into an argument with, uh, with Ben-Gurion, and he's certainly not here to defend himself. It might be that in the founding of the state, that was the only system that was possible. I don't know. I'm not an historian. I'm not an expert. Great centralization of power, being attacked by, uh, by, uh, by our neighbors. But I do know this, and this is my uh, uh, firm belief. First of all, I think Israel succeeded in the first few decades despite socialism and not because of it. And I think there is no system that is more antithetical to genius where genius can succeed less than in a socialist system. Socialism stifles innovation. It is a straitjacket. So here you have, in the people of Israel, the most dynamic, innovative people in the world, which has now become clearer and clearer, and I think it's going to become clearer and clearer in the future, and you've put them in a socialist straitjacket. That's crazy. We used to think in Israel that somehow Israel was stuck with all the, uh, with all the lemons, right? All the good Jews went everywhere else in the world because they were wildly successful, and Israel got stuck with the lemons, and then something happened. You know, these lemons uh, would, would get on a plane, and they would leave Israel, and they'd show up in Silicon Valley or somewhere else, and they'd turn into plums. Amazing. So maybe it didn't have to do with the people. Maybe it had to do with the system. Uh, and what happens is, when you have all this brain power and you have a socialist economy, you can't really do very much with it. Uh, and if you don't believe me, go look at the number of brilliant scientists and engineers that they had in the Soviet Union. Brain power enough is not enough for economy. By the way, if you have a free market and you don't have brain power, you'll have gr better growth and better prosperity than a, in a country that has brain power and doesn't have free markets. Um, but once you tie brain power uh, and freedom together, then the sky's the limit. So what I see is the first period in Israel's history is essentially socialism um, and Israel succeeding despite of it. You know, you can do certain things, and even in a command and control economy, where you lay down roads, you lay down the basic infrastructure, if you don't have a lot of corruption, you can get things done, and you can grow at high rates of growth for a certain percentage, a certain number of years. People forget the Soviet Union for about 25 years was actually catching up to the United States in terms of growth rates because you can, like I said, command people to do certain things and they were moving forward and a lot of people were writing in the 1970s in the United States that the Soviet style is proving itself or in the late 60s and they're catching up in their rates of growth and all that. So Israel was able to basically make the basic infrastructure of a state and to continue to develop but I think it did it despite uh, socialism. And then what I've seen happen in the last, more or less the last 20 years, Israel has been in a period of, of reform. Um, and those reform, I think the person who's been at the center of those reforms has been Netanyahu, both his, I mean if you think about it, he's been prime minister for eight years, eight to nine years. He was finance minister, even though it seems like he was finance minister for maybe five or six years, he was actually finance minister for less than two and a half years. He just did a lot. Uh, in that, uh, in that period. So you're talking about about 11 years. So at least half the time. I would take it from about 1996. It's true that you had the 
stabilization efforts in the mid-80s, but basically the attempt to reform Israel's economy, I would say, is about 18 years old, and Netanyahu has been, for over half that period, he's been the leading economic uh, force, um, driving economic policy in the country. And that goes back to 1996 um, with the currency controls. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but in 1996, you couldn't put, move ten, more than $10,000 inside and outside of Israel. How much did we have in venture capital investment last year? $2.7 billion? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You couldn't move $10,000. I mean, my, my Safta would, you know, have the stories of, like, sewing money into the, the brassiere, as she used to call it. I mean, it's ridiculous. This was in 1996. It's not at the end, you know, at the end of the 19th century. In 1996, Netanyahu had a fight with a very good man named Dan Maridor, who didn't want to actually get rid of the currency controls, and Maridor resigned over that fight. He resigned over the fight for freeing up Israel's currency. So in the first term, you had a couple of things. I said in the phone, in the phone area, you had the, uh, the currency controls. The big changes, I think, happened in 2003 when Netanyahu was finance minister. And the most important thing is not the policy, it's the mindset. And I'll explain to you why. Don't ever minimize the impact of how you see the problem and your analysis of the problem and your overall approach to trying to fix it, rather than necessarily the specific policy tools. If it was just the specific policy tools, we could get technocrats and move them around to every country in the world and you'll have the same economic results everywhere. It doesn't work that way. There are huge changes that leaders make in certain countries because they were able basically to drive through their ideas through the policy making process. In 2003, here, were the, here was the reality in Israel. And Ayal remembers this very well. 2000, at the beginning of 2003, Israel had a negative 1% growth rate. Negative 1% for the second year in a row. Israel's economy had shrunk. We are a growing population in Israel, which is rare. We have a higher, in the industrial world, um, uh, we're the only one with a growing population. So we actually lost in two years per capita growth about 7%, about 3 to 4% each year for two years, beginning of 2003. We were at almost an 11% unemployment rate. We had on 102% GD, uh, debt to GDP level. Um, and the G in that equation, G plus C plus I plus... That G was over 50%, it was 52%. When Netanyahu took over at the beginning of 2003, and people were concerned that an Israeli bank was gonna collapse. And I was with him at the time when we had all the experts in Israel who came to him and gave him economic advice. Here is what the experts said, and Ayal can vouch for that, because he was, I don't know if you were physically sitting in a lot of those meetings. Basically, the analysis of Israel's economic problem was the following. NASDAQ had collapsed three years before, and there was an intifada. That was the problem. And what you needed to do, Mr. Prime Minister, well, I'll put it to you this way, or Mr. Finance Minister, I'm going to make you all finance ministers of Israel. And I'm just giving you my analysis. The problem in Israel's economy and the reason why we have this slow growth, the reason why we're in this deep recession, the reason why we have a deficit at the time of 6% and ballooning is because of the intifada and because of the collapse of NASDAQ. What are you going to do, Mr. Finance Minister? Well, if that's your analysis of the problem, there's only, thing, only one thing for you to do, which is to go visit uh, you know, the Jewish community of Hawaii. Because there's nothing you can do about the collapse of NASDAQ, and your role in affecting the intifada is as important as the role of the Minister of Interior or any other minister in the Israeli government, right? There's nothing to do. And the arguments that people were making at the time, what they were saying to Netanyahu was basically tax and spend. To tax and spend your way out of the uh, recession. And higher taxes, higher spending, the traditional sort of Keynesian approach to kick the economy forward. And I was in one after the other. I won't even say the names, but I remember a lot of experts. Now, Netanyahu had a very different view of the problem. He agreed the fact that we have an intifada created a problem. People think, you know, collapse of tourism. You know what tourism, you, people know here. You ask most people what percentage of the Israeli economy is tourism, ask people who follow Israel, who are not sort of in the weeds, they'll tell you usually 30%. Now, you're laughing. Go, to, mark my words, okay? Ask some people who don't follow the Israeli economy, um, but who go to Israel, ask them what percent of the economy you think is tourism. I guarantee you'll get a number 20, 30%, maybe even higher. And at the time, 
it was 3%. I don't know what the exact percentage is today, but it had gone down, I think, from 3 to maybe 2 or 1.7%. That was the whole thing of, uh, of the Intifada. So he says, yeah, there's no doubt that the Intifada has affected it, and there's no doubt that the collapse of Nasdaq has created a problem. But Israel's got a major problem, and that is we have <coughs> insufficient degrees of freedom in our economy. And his point of view was, I have this crisis right now. This is my opportunity to actually reform this place and give it a huge sweeping kick, a huge capitalist kick, to do whatever I can to push you know, more competition, more freedom, uh, and to generate their, and to thereby generate growth. And what he did was actually reject the advice of all the experts at the time and did the exact opposite. What he did was drastically lower taxes and drastically cut spending. He put in a law in Israel that you could only have 1% cap spending at 1%, he lowered the 1% increase. And we're a growing population, so when you do that, you're actually shrinking the overall size of the government budget. Um, he cut taxes, marginal taxes, from 64% uh, to 49% uh, over year after year. And he sent a trajectory. Not only did he announce to the markets, I'm going to cut taxes, and here's what it's going to look like. And then he had, they had a second cut to go from 49 to 44 with the income taxes. The corporate taxes were cut from 36 to 25 then they had to try to do another strategy, which then stalled later to cut it from 25 uh, to 18. Then they started privatization, which Ayal can give you chapter and verse on the whole thing. And basically, Netanyahu was of a mindset to privatize everything that moved. I mean, I don't know what it was like for you to go in and to speak to him, but he was saying, okay, what do you have for me today? What can you sell off for me today? Because his understanding was he had to move fast. He had to move on many fronts simultaneously. I was discussing this with Dan and Roger before that he was visited by Roger, um, uh, Roger Douglas, uh, who was the, he was the guy before Thatcher from New Zealand. He was a labor minister from the New Zealand that instituted all these reforms in a country that has more sheep than people and basically made a huge revolution in New Zealand. And the advice that, that Roger Douglas gave to the prime minister at the time was you should reform on many fronts simultaneously for two reasons. The first is the sum total of these reforms will be greater than any individual reform because you will be sending a signal to the market that you are pushing this whole economy in a big direction. And people won't just, you know, do be bean counters on your specific policy. They'll understand that there is a completely new direction to policy. And the second thing is your opponents to reform will have to actually oppose many fronts. If you only open one front, it'll be much more difficult for you <clears throat> for you to succeed. So he did it, and he started privatizing, and there was the phone company, and there was Bank Little Me, and there was the national refineries, and then he went after the pension uh, um, uh, system where he wanted to reform that, where he raised the retirement age. He always says, I'm still looking for the, for the voter who will tell me that they voted for me because I raised the retirement age. Uh, Israel was the only country at the time to even deal with it. I think Chile was one other country in the world, Chile, that had done something with their retirement age, but Look, these, this is an issue that everybody knows what has to be done, uh, and nobody has the political will to do it. When they established Social Security in 1935, the life expectancy was 63 in this country. So people thought that, um, that the elderly would, that not the elderly, people thought that retirees would be dead before they'd be collecting Social Security. Now what you've seen is, is the chart go up where people are now living not to 63, but to 78 or 79, and the whole numbers then have been shifted. And it's obvious that you have to change that and you have to raise the retirement age and you have to do it over time and you have to do it in a sensible way. But that's the way that you can immediately change a huge, all these huge entitlement problems and everything that people are talking about. That can be resolved. It just takes uh, the political will to do it. So he went, you know, pensions, uh, lower taxes, lower spending, uh, privatization, basically, everywhere that you could think of where he was going to push these reforms. Now, some of them succeeded, some of them did not succeed. Um, but overall, what has happened in Israel since then is that 1% reduction in uh, GDP changed within, I think it was, a, uh, what was it, six months or nine months, we had moved into a positive 5%. So we went from negative one to five, and Israel has grown more or less, some, I don't know what the number, if it's 4.5% for the last 10 years. We had a 2008, a little blip, where it was about 0%. But basically, you've had 10 years of growth. This 102% number um, 
of debt to GDP is now down to with 73, 72 percent, uh, when every virtually every other country in the world exploded, especially after 2008 and 2009, Israel's debt to GDP ratio is going down. And what does that mean? Talk about social justice. No one talks about reducing the debt. But if you reduce the debt, it means you're going to pay less interest on the debt, and it means you're going to have more of your budget to pay for all the social services that you want to have. So you go from 102 percent to 75 percent. <coughs> unemployment was halved, and they changed the way that unemployment is actually measured in Israel. So it, and that increased it. But I think right now, what is it in Israel? A little over six? Right? At the time, it was near 11. But under the old system, you'd be probably around five. So it halved the rate of unemployment. Um, and Israel basically has maintained a very, very sound fiscal policy for the last, uh, for the last 10 years. And that the, the, the measure of a success of a policy is when your people who attack you politically take over and don't change it. That's the measure of a success. The success of Thatcher was that when Blair came into office, he didn't change. He didn't really change her policies. And that was and the measure of success was of Reagan was when Clinton came over, he didn't really change the policy. He did he he sort of made changes at the margins, but the overall thrust of po policy uh, continued. So what you have in Israel basically is this first period of socialism, this next period what I would say is real reform, and. Now the question is, what's going to happen um, in the future? I'm e extremely bullish about how much Israel can, go, can grow and will grow. Now, it's not to say that I don't think there are problems. One of the reasons why I'm so bullish is because I think there are huge problems. To me, the biggest problem in the Israeli economy is that 10 to 15 families control a huge share of the country's wealth, something that I don't know in the first world if there's any other example like that. That is a system that you have in Israel that has to break open. And I, I'm not an expert on the committees that have been established to try to deal with the concentrations of power. But if you ask me, the number one problem facing Israel <coughs> is to break up this control of a few families and crossover uh, industries over the Israeli economy. Believe me, I'm the last person in the world to say anything against uh, wealth. I think wealth actually drives growth, it drives innovation, people should be able to uh, profit from their success, but it must be competitive capitalism. They must achieve that in a competitive system. The second challenge that I think Israel um, has to deal with, which I think is a huge opportunity as well, is integrating the ultra-Orthodox into the workforce. One of the interesting things about all these terrific numbers of Israel is the labor force participation rate in Israel is about seven or eight points lower than it is in the OECD average. You know, we've moved our numbers in that OECD. Growth rates are up, debt is down, government spending, which I told you before, which is over 50%, is now about 40%. And in fact, the discourse in Israel is that it's too low as a, as a share. I think it should be lower for, for, for different reasons. But one of the problems that we have vis-a-vis -vis the OECD is that we've got 8% fewer people as uh, some American politicians used to say, who are sitting in the wagon rather than pulling the wagon. <clears throat> and I think there is a tremendous dynamism and brain power in that population. And if Israel succeeds at integrating them into the economy, it's a huge boost. To me, that is the, the immigrants from the former Soviet Union who sort of pushed up the whole Israeli economy. They're actually sitting in Israel's yeshiva. We've got a whole hundreds of thousands of people that once they integrate into the Israeli economy uh, and once they put that grain power to use for the Israeli economy, um, I think it's going to be enormously um, an enormous source um, for Israel's continued success. And when you look at what's going to happen in the next few decades, you see, as the Prime Minister says a lot, that we're in a decade of, uh, century of knowledge. And the ability to create conceptual products is going to be the single most important thing driving success. Israel is not in the same economic situation as Holland or as um, even a country like Singapore or even some many success stories. We are a source for innovation in the world. There are not that many sources of innovation out there. There is Silicon Valley and there is Israel. Those are the two leading forces in the world. Now, I don't think that this is going to just jump from country to country. And I don't think it's enough to just simply have the right fiscal policy and the tax and spending policy. You have to have policies that are going to continue to allow for this brain power 
to get access to more capital and to be in a freer and freer environment in order to uh, unleash it. And there are some people who are worried that if Israel doesn't, I mean, if Israel doesn't do this and that, then we're going to have a problem. My only concern for Israel's economic future is a brain drain, is that we don't make it possible for people to actually make a lot of money in Israel and to succeed in Israel and to have a high quality of life that they will decide to actually go elsewhere. That to me is actually the single greatest problem that we have to prevent. You have to make sure that a young Israeli who could live anywhere that they wanted to live in the world will decide to stay in Israel because he can succeed in Israel. And that's one of the reasons why this whole housing, to me the housing issue is to prevent a brain drain. Because you can't be in a situation where two-thirds your salary level is two-thirds of what it is in the world and the housing prices are triple. That's a very dangerous combination. So how do you figure out how to do that? I don't know. I know people have tried. Um, but we have to have a situation where Israelis can really succeed within Israel. And success is not a crime uh, in Israel, but where Israelis can, um, uh, can definitely succeed. Now, Paul Krugman, who uh, is a Nobel Prize winning economist, he wrote a book. Uh, many years ago that I read called Peddling Prosperity. And did you ever read it? Well, he has a chapter in that book uh, uh, that I haven't forgotten. You know, his views on a lot of issues I, I'm not going to pass judgment on, but he is a brilliant economist. And he actually, the, purpo the, the book, purpose of the book was to say that once ideas are discredited in academia, that's when politicians take them and run with them in the real world. And that was his point. But he has this brilliant chapter called The Economics of QWERTY. So anyone know what QWERTY is? Keyboard. The keyboard, yeah. Q-W-E-R-T-Y. So if you look at your uh, phones, you'll see it. Now here's, here's what he says. He is trying, he's an economist that is not such a free market uh, uh, economist, let's say. I'll, I'm a diplomat, so I'll say that in understated language. He, want, he wanted in his book to show cases where this idea of the markets taking care of themselves breaks down, where they don't lead to optimal solutions, right? So he brings the example of QWERTY. And the example is this. In the old typewriters, I remember this. My mother, I think, still has one in the house. If you would type too fast, they would all bunch up. All the keys would, jump, would jam. So they designed the original keyboard in a way that would be sub-optimal. Uh, that you couldn't actually type that fast. That's why the letters don't make any sense. I mean, the letters should be kind of like a Wheel of Fortune. Vanna White should have designed the keyboard because you know what letters are used more often than not. But here, letters that you often use are on the sides. <clears throat> and they did that so that they wouldn't punch up. So the question that Krugman asks is now we have word processors. Why don't they just fix it? Now it's really easy. You can have a much more efficient keyboard, which will allow everyone to type faster. And then he said, well, they won't fix it. He was writing this 20 years ago, before the age of the internet, where now everybody knows how to type. And when I was in college, that's when internet uh, started. You know, the, sort of the, my wife is four years younger than me. She had internet in college. And so like, I'm attached to the older generation, and she's with the younger generation. But at that point, when he was writing the book, not everybody uh, typed. And he said, well, there are secretaries who type, and there's industries where people type. And people will not make the jump because the cost of making the jump is too high. It's true in a perfect world, the cost would be little if everyone would get together and make the jump together and pass through this. But now there's no way. You're locked in. He said you're locked in. You're locked into a suboptimal situation. So market forces are not going to lead you to the best uh, solution. And that's why I explained why all the carpet manufacturers in the United States are in the Carolinas. Because what happens is a business comes in, sets up shop, the employees come in who work in that industry, and then another business comes in because they want access to those employees, and then more employees come in because they know, hey, I've got a skill set. Now there's two companies there, and this process happens, and all of a sudden, you've got all the carpet manufacturers in a small place. That's what he explains. That's how you have a Silicon Valley. Because Silicon Valley, the businesses come in, the employees come in, now you have a market, more and more people go there, more and more businesses set up shop there, and now you're sort of locked in. Israel, to me, is in a quirky situation when it comes to high tech. And it's a quirky situation because of the great advantage of our small size. 99% of Israel's strategic problems that we face, 99% is the physical size of the country. I know that most people think the greatest problem in the world is that Israel is too big. But 99% of our problem as a country is this tiny size of the country.
If we were 50 times the size of the country like Egypt, or 500 times the size of our country like the United States, well then rockets from Gaza would complete, be completely different order of threat, and even a nuclear weapon in the hand of some fanatic regime would be a completely different threat. We are a very, very small country. That's the number one security problem that we actually face. Now if you're a small country surrounded by, you know, Luxembourg and uh, Belgium, then it's not that bad. But when you're a small country and you've got some dangerous neighbors, and ask the Belgians, and ask those who were around in the 1940s, and they'll tell you then you have a big problem. When you're a small country with dangerous neighbors. But in, the, in economics, the small size of our country for innovation is a huge advantage. Because we have in a very small place, military, which is the, the curse that turns into a blessing. The fact that we've, the unfortunate, or the fortunate Con uh, a side effect of the unfortunate consequence that we have to always fight to defend ourselves is that we have our best and our brightest going through uh, the military and getting access to the latest innovations in technology and that's unique you know here you have MIT and you have Harvard and you have a few places we have Shimona Matayim and we've got three or four other units where the best and the brightest are all going through you can imagine what it would be a resource for a country I mean I, I was with the, with the the uh, Prime Minister up at Apple, speaking to the head of Apple and, when he, yeah, Apple, and when he found out that basically Israel's military uh, agencies are competing to get access to the top one, per, one tenth of one percent, he just wanted to know where that list was. Because you don't have a, select, a selection process like that where you can actually get those, those great minds, just want to know how can, how can Apple get these people, we'll put them in Apple University, we'll get them coming out of the other side. So we have on the one hand this military and all the dynamism there. Then we have academia also, and the third is we have business. And so you have them all in a very small area, huge advantage uh, for the country to create a kind of critical mass. And when I look ahead, and this is, I'll end with this, when I look ahead I see three areas that beyond everything that I've said, which is basically we were a closed society, we've become a freer society, now, as, as long as we continue on that track, the sky's the limit, there are three other areas where I think Israel is going to be, uh, has real uh, opportunity. And people may dismiss what I'm going to say, um, but understand something. If the Israeli ambassador was sitting in this chair 30 years ago and told you that Israel was going to become a global high-tech power, you would have all laughed. And when you said he's kidding himself. Israel is a global high-tech power, and no one saw it 30 years ago because we have the brain power that we have in the country. So it doesn't matter that it's not happening today, it will happen. The first area is cyber. The Prime Minister says he's determined to make Israel the cyber, Be'er Sheva, specifically the cyber capital of the world. That's gonna happen. Right now Israel's 5% of the exports of the world in cyber, 5%. Now we're one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population. So we're punching 50 times above our weight in cyber, 50 times. It's like a country that's 400 million strong. It's about the size of the Europe, Israel, and cyber. In investment in cyber, we're 11%. Okay? That's 110 times our weight. That puts us close to India and China as a country. Now, what they're doing is, as you know, bringing the resources from the military down to the Negev. You have Ben Gurion University, a first-rate university, and then you develop incubators around their technological incubators for, to create a sign of cyber ecosystem. And I think that Israel is, I, I definitely uh, believe that Israel is going to be a leader here. And I think once you bring, uh, there's no reason why we should have the Pentagon in Times Square in Israel. That's what we had. Pen Israel's Pentagon is in Times Square, sitting on the real estate that it is. But we have to start the process of moving those military assets to the south, having young people and their families go there, and you're going to create a courty type of atmosphere around Beersheba. When I went with the Prime Minister to London, and that trip 10 years ago, he met with all these investors and he said to them, just invest in Israel, buy anything you want. And I know every finance minister tells you that, but let me tell you something, I'm going to reform Israel's economy. This is before he did anything. And I can tell you for any level of risk, if we reform, we're going to get growth. So all asset prices in Israel are going to rise. So just invest in anything you want. I'm telling you now, all of you here, buy an apartment in Beersheba. Buy an apartment in Beersheba because the cost of that is going to go up. It doesn't matter, buy anything. Buy anything around Beersheba because that area is going to be a huge generator of growth. That's the first area. The second area is gas, okay? 
You ask me, the Israeli ambassador who's going to sit in this chair 20 years from now is going to talk about Israel become, become a, ga a power in gas technologies. We've never been there because we never had it. The old joke was that Moses was a great leader but a lousy navigator because he took us to the one place in the Middle East that doesn't have any oil. We got lucky that it took us 65 years to find it, in my view, because had we found it on day one, I don't know if Israel would have developed the way that it did. But what doesn't exist now and what people can be cynical about and we don't know this and we can't do this, take those minds and now connect them to the gas. We're going to be a power in gas in the same way that Israel now is a power in water, in water technology, because necessity was the mother of invention. We had to make do with less, and I think this is an area that Israel really stands out on vis-a-vis -vis the United States, because the United States you know, has great companies, great minds, great, they're not experts at doing more with less. In Israel, we actually are experts at doing more with less, for many cultural reasons. Um, and all the innovations that you see happening in water, to stop innovations to stop spillage, innovations to come up with all sorts of techniques come out because that was a problem that Israel was focused on. <coughs> Gas has not been a problem that Israel's been focused on. We're going to focus on in it. And if I were running a, a major gas corporation in the United States, I'd set up an R&D facility tomorrow in Israel because all these great minds will start focusing on this problem of gas and you're going to see wonderful innovations. The last thing is whether or not we can succeed at turning what is a what, what is a geopolitical problem into a geo uh, strategic opportunity. But I, I mean by that Israel's actual location. Israel's location has long been a uh, disadvantage. And it's disadvantage throughout history. If you keep digging in the ground in Israel, you find all the layers of all the conquerors who came through because you're at the center, basically, of three different continents coming through. But this is an issue that I, the Prime Minister has spoken about for the last... 10 years, um, and it's been very hard to push it through because of Israel's system. Had he been president, uh, this would have been done a long time ago. And that is, the, the world has shifted from to manufacturing goods in Asia. It used to be you would take the raw materials, bring them to Europe and the United States, raw materials from Asia, bring the mat raw materials to Europe and the United States or Africa, raw materials, and then manufacture them and consume them there. Here you have manufacturing shifting to Asia and all those goods have got to go still for the next 20 or 30 years before consumption really kicks in in Asia, which it will, will still go to Europe and the United States. Well, they're getting to the United States by going to California on huge container ships. How are they getting to Europe? They're going on huge container ships and they're going through the Suez Canal. So the idea already 10 years ago was why don't we make Israel, why don't we put Israel firmly on this highway? We have a deep water port, in Jordan has a deep water port in Aqaba, where they were shipping out Saddam's uh, oil. And why can't we get Aqaba a lot, somehow the port, so that these massive container ships will go in, unload their, unload their goods, put them on feeder ships to go to, Ash, to uh, put them on a rail line, excuse me, to go to Ashdod, and then from Ashdod to feeder ships, it's going to go to Europe. Now, once you build that rail line, you've actually changed Israel. Uh, and those of you who want to understand why, I suggest that you get in a car and you start driving west. And then you will see all the cities in America that were built up around those rail lines. You can then actually put two more cities in the Negev that are sitting on those rail lines. And I remember all these discussions, and people here who were in the finance ministry, maybe they can speak to it, about, again, the bean counter trying to figure out if it's profitable to put this line, if it's going to justify the traffic. Believe me, this is a massive project that once we get that rail line and we get those ships going, you are putting Israel on a huge, huge highway of goods. It's also an insurance policy for the Suez Canal, because while we hope for the best, you always want to be in a situation, you never want to be in a situation where somebody has a chokehold on the world economy. And if we can figure out how to take advantage of the physical location of having all those goods being shipped, of having gas, the question of what we're going to do with the gas, of exporting it in the region, and also maybe exporting it uh, an LNG facility, if that's the decision that they make to go um, out east, we have a huge opportunity to change, um, to turn Israel's location into a huge asset. So this is a, a, a short ending to a long speech. I think that what you've seen in Israel is the tip of the iceberg. And my faith and confidence in Israel's economy, it may sound cliche and it may sound like it's just you know, political spin, 
is actually the dynamism of Israel's people. We are the most dynamic people in the world by far, the most innovative people in the world by far. That's not going anywhere. It's deeply embedded in the culture. In my view, it's because we're a skeptical people. That's the secret of our success because we constantly ask questions. We constantly don't take the status quo. We constantly want to challenge. And I think the culture of innovation in Israel is here to stay. If the leadership in Israel will not do monumentally foolish things by putting more regulations and more taxes and, more, and burdening that economy, if they will free it up as much as possible, then the innovation will come uh, to the surface in all of these different areas. And then I think for Israel's future, the sky's the limit. Thank you.